This is flip video 6.1. Please label this as what factors encouraged the European age of exploration. So a little bit of background here. Um, this PowerPoint is set up a little bit differently. I'm going to highly encourage you to be um, to exercise, to actually engage with the text and take down the information that you find important. I'm not expecting you to take down every single word here. And I'd like you to work on organizing the notes yourself. Of what should be going on the left-hand side, looking for key ideas, main themes. That will ensure your notes are streamlined and best reflect the key information. So let's get rock and rolling. All right, so from 1400s to the 1700s, Europe experienced an age of exploration. Perhaps you put that on the left, just a suggestion. Now, it's important on the phrasing there. We're discussing Europe because there, there are other areas of the world that had been um, experiencing this global maritime, which means sailing, trading, for a long period of time. This was driven, so the, um, the origins or the motivations, motivations might be a good thing to put on the left, it's not, whereas really motivated by the, Euro, the Renaissance because this curiosity, this humanism, this secularism had really driven this idea of focusing on the human world and the human society and encouraged this and really fed to a desire to encourage trade on a global level. And as a result, the long-term impact of this is that European nations became powerful as a result of the way they took advantage of the places that they found, and they also spread their influence throughout the world. So this is going to be the, mark the true beginning of European uh, nations exerting global influence and, more specifically, global control and conquest. So let's start off here with this question of why is it, though, that Europeans wanted to explore? So that might be a good thing to put on the left-hand side. The first, of course, was gold, okay, more specifically just generally money. This gold or this desire for new sources of wealth was the main reason for European exploration. Um, as we discussed and will discuss, um, I'm going to cover this map, let's go back here for just a minute so you can see it a little bit better. The city of Constantinople, located directly in between um, at the corner of the Black Sea, separating Turkey and the Asia from Europe essentially here, that the desire to gain gold um, really took off when the Constantinople fell to the Muslim Empire, to the Ottoman, the rising power of the Ottoman Turks. The Europeans had been exposed to the goods of Asia, and they really wanted them. They really wanted those goods, and they really wanted access to those to those resources. But the only thing that Asia was willing to trade for their silks and their um, their tea, for example, was gold. And Europeans didn't have it, so Europeans began to explore looking for new ways to get these resources that you see here, these perfumes, spices, cotton, precious stones, ivory, porcelain. They're, the Crusades is what, and the Renaissance had stimulated this desire for these exotic Asian luxury goods, but the Europeans didn't have it, thus they set sail for new seas and new places to get these resources. And that's what we see here. Secondly, under gold, um, merchants were, and these, these businessmen were looking for quick and direct routes to Asia to avoid Muslims. And that's what I was referring to when I said the fall of Constantinople. The Europeans wanted to, if you look up in Europe and if you see the Ottoman Empire, they, were, they set sail west, right, because they're looking for a way to get to these areas you see on the right-hand side of your screen, which would be Asia, right? They were, if they didn't know that North America and South America existed, then it makes perfect sense that they think they can just sail right around going west and encounter China. They were unaware of the existence of North America and South America, which is why um, we have the, the later uh, confusing terminology of Indians that we'll get to momentarily. They're looking for these, these merchants are looking to avoid contact with the Muslims, get a direct route for, to China that they, where they could bypass the Muslim traders. And specifically, the Italians were interested um, in increasing those profits. And they, excuse me, bypass the Italians so that the Western European empires could get the profits for themselves. Left hand side, third reason glory, right? The Renaissance inspired new possibilities for power and prestige, this new fame. The Renaissance had really um, engaged with a greater audience. People were more connected with one another intellectually. People were seeking fame and, and fortune. So they, uh, this motivated many of the explorers to seek funding from their monarchs and to take off and set sail for new places. It, it provided these, the Europeans the opportunity, as it says here, to rise from poverty, gain fame, fortune, and status. The kings who sponsored the voyages of exploration, they were looking for new sources for their own power and their own wealth for their nation. Because what we see is a rising global competition between the, um, the kings and the monarchs of Europe. If, as we will see, if Portugal becomes successful, then Spain too is going to take off on these voyages to increase its own wealth as a country and its own power in this global, this growing global economy. So it's both the power, the glory for the person and the glory and the fame for the country. 
uh, lastly, God, right? European Christians, especially the Catholics, they wanted to spread the stop. They wanted to stop the spread of Islam and convert non-Christians to the faith. This was largely as a result of the Protestant Reformation, as the Catholic Church had been losing followers, um, and had been there's uh, under new criticism per se. There was an uh, increasing urgency for the Catholic Church to both promote a more positive image of itself among other people, and to revive the faith and to gain new followers. So what we saw is this term, you can put this on the left as well, is the rise of missionaries. So the, the explorers were encouraged to themselves to try to convert people that they encountered, and they'd bring along missionaries of priests and nuns and, and monks and friars who would all seek to convert um, the native peoples to, the, uh, to Christianity. Sadly, this was not a peaceful process. This conversion of Catholicism was largely forced upon most of the people that they encountered, and that's something we'll get into greater in detail uh, with later in the unit. So this question of means, means means the ways, right? So that's why they wanted to go. What were the way, what enabled them to do so? How were the explorers able to set sail to go so far and then to make it all the way back again? I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of miles across these oceans. It wasn't just desire, it was also just the ability. Before the Renaissance, that'd be a good thing on the left as well. Sailors didn't have the technology. You couldn't, there wasn't, just simply wasn't the means available, which helped us understand why we had this large scale European exploration at the time that we did. It wasn't just interest, it was also, as I said, the technology that made it happen. Firstly, uh, for navigation, the, uh, the trade and cultural diffusion that was occurring during the Renaissance, um, sparked initially by the Crusades, really introduced these new navigation techniques to Europeans that they gained from several different sources of information. They also had a far better understanding of wind patterns and, and currents that they would have to, the currents of the water and the wind patterns, of course, um, while they're at sea, are two extremely important concepts to navigate effectively and efficiently uh, while at sea for extended periods of time. One of the first, uh, I'm sorry, I'll go back there, you can see the picture. There we go. Um, magnetic compass on the left made sailing more accurate. So they got the magnetic compass from the interactions with the, with the Asian empires, that that meant that they could uh, clearly <laughs> sail with purpose and direction. Another term on the left, astrolabe. The astrolabe was uh, a tool which is used just as you see here. Um, this is where trigonometry comes into real life. You, if you can calculate an angle, direct, a 90 degree angle, then you can, you can in fact navigate using the stars um, to figure out the direction in which the, you, the, the, the ships were heading, which is important because this is the first time that people, this is important, uh, the astrolabe, I'm sorry, oh here we go. Astrolabe is important, um, but most effective when you're close to um, to land, but when you're not close to land, then you have to use the horizon um, to do so. So these are all new ways of understanding how to be so far away from land and can continue to go in the right direction. Cartography. Cartography is a map making. Maps were even more accurate, um, and now they started to include longitude and latitude, which we talked about as some of the Renaissance innovations at the time. And that, of course, is going to uh, lead, well, that first, first will lead to the creation of what's known as a Mercator map that has these lines of longitude and latitude meeting at right angles. And all of that ensured that sailors could move far more effectively and measure their, their trips themselves. Shipbuilding, uh, the term caravel, you want to put it on the left-hand side. The caravel was a much, much stronger and better ship that could travel in the open seas and in the shallow water. You can see, no need to copy this down, but you can see some of the, the um, innovations associated with that. It was 65 feet in length. The triangular sail was a big deal because the triangular sail makes it far more aerodynamic and allows the ship itself to have far more control over the direction in which they are heading. And the combination of the, the, the triangular sail and the square sail really made for precise navigation. Um, you can see the large cargo area, which would be very important if you're going on a very long voyage. We're talking multiple months to get across the sea. Um, so these are all some, some significant changes to the physical way in which they would travel. Um, oh, I forgot I had this in there. Okay. Caravels, they had the triangular lateen sails that allowed the, sails to sip against, to sh the ships to sail haha, um, against the wind. And so again, if you're, that's just obviously extremely important if you're trying to navigate um, more than just going with the direction of the wind. This is what we allow sailors and, and ships to sail back and return. Um, another important part of the caravel is the movable rudder. That's what the, actually provides the direction. It's the, um, I wish this is one of the times I wish I could show you. Uh, the movable rudder, rudder you can imagine just as a pointed um, tool on the bottom of the ship that really helps direct the ship in the direction of the ship. Cannons and rifles that could be added to the caravel to give the ships protection. Well, which because we saw a rise of piracy, of criminal, of uh, robbery at seas, so the the protection of the ship was important too. 
So who were these people? Who were these explorers? Where did they go? And what was their impact upon world history? As I already mentioned, I said I'd come back to this, the Europeans were not the first explorers to, explore, to go out on the oceans. They were not the first. They were not the first ones going out to explore these trade routes. You can see we already had the Silk Road existing. Something we don't study at length in this class, but I wish we did, was the extensive Indian Ocean trade that occurred, which you see here in blue. Um, tremendous interactions between East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, India, and Southwest Ch Southeast China at these times. We have the Trans-Sahara trade routes. We have the Mediterranean Sea trade routes. So this is this is certainly certainly not the time, the first time that you're that anyone is exploring for trade, but it is the first time that we see what's uh, these global interactions between the Americas and the Afro-European and Asian uh, continents. I uh, mentioned this already. The, uh, in particular, Islamic, mer Islamic merchants were ones that were uh, particularly dominant in the Indian Ocean trade. They had the spice trade all across from Asia to, to Europe. What those Europeans were trying to get their hands on um, was dominated by the Muslim market and Muslim traders much, much, much more earlier than uh, when the Europeans set sail. A particular um, one of the, sh the explorers that I want to focus on, I'm going to pause this for one second, be right back. Okay, sorry, we're back. Um, the Chinese explorer that was most famous at the time was Zhen He, who was a, led these Chinese treasure fleets, so ones that were going out to gain these uh, riches. And seven expeditions all across Southeast Asia, India, and Africa during the period of time that's known as the Ming Dynasty, which is a little bit ahead of, we left off at the uh, Yuan Dynasty of the Mongols. So what will then soon come is the Ming Dynasty. So it's important to understand that the Chinese were a big player here, especially in Southeast Asia, which also helps us understand some of their modern global day um, global influence. But there's a shift here. And this shift is that the, what the Europeans were able to do that neither the Muslims or the Chinese explorers, not necessarily even could, but wanted to do, was that they began this global exploration, as I just mentioned. And more specifically, what they do is they create colonies. And colonies were when these Euro the European um, nations were coming to land that they believed they were entitled to <laughs> and claimed that land, they colonized it as their own. And we'll talk about that term in much, much greater detail, but for now I want to plant the seed that one of the big differences is that the Chinese didn't conquer this territory. They did not take or assert this land as their own that they were going out to quote-unquote explore. And they created, these European colonies were, cre were created for the purpose of increasing the wealth and power of the original, what are sometimes called mother countries from Europe. The leader in this, this um, process was Portugal. Portugal was the early leader in the age of exploration. You can see that on the Iberian Peninsula, which is made up of Spain and Portugal. Portugal was the leading one largely because of this man, a man named Prince Henry the Navigator. Prince Henry the Navigator actually did not go out on these explorations himself, but rather what he's most known for is starting a school of navigation to train the sailors. What he would do is he brought in all those, the, he centralized a lot of the technology and the knowledge that was associated with the age of exploration. Um, he used the shipbuilders, the sailing instructors, and he wanted all of those people in this one uh, centralized location because he wanted to find the territories that would allow him to have a quick route to Asia. So as I mentioned already, they want to bypass the Muslim traders in the sea and uh, the Ottoman Turks who have taken over Constantinople. They want a direct route to Asia. To, inter to increase their own power and gain better access to the Asian goods. As you can see here, Prince Henry's navigation school and his willingness to fund the voyages led Portugal to be the first of the European nations to explore the west coast of Africa. Now at this time, Portugal's interactions with uh, Africa were, began first on trading, exclusively on trading. What, uh, sadly, this will devolve into the development of the global of the transatlantic slave trade, but we're not there yet. In the initial explorations, there were complementary trading relationships, there were trading ports all over the west coast of Africa, that was led as that that was really um, paved by here by Prince Henry the Navigator. Another Portuguese explorer, Vasco da Gama, on the left hand side, was the first explorer to find the direct trade route to Asia by going around Africa to get in, get to India, which is and that route is what you see here on the map here. He was the first to go. To, uh, to go all the way to the tip of Africa and around to, uh, to India. And, and eventually, um, the, this, this became a very um, well-used route by the Portuguese to get them uh, access to greater goods. So this, De Gama's first successful 
route to Asia uh, really fueled a lot of the Portuguese success in during the age of, ex well, I shouldn't say success, but prestige during the age of exploration. Portugal created colonies. As I mentioned, it started off as these complementary trading relationships, but ultimately Portugal, much like all the other European countries, began to actually create colonies where they're claiming this territory as their own. You can see in the red, oh, excuse me, the purple, are the territories that were claimed by Portugal. Um, they had some in Brazil and the Spice Islands, which you see on the right-hand side of uh, this map in Southeast Asia. This, the, this map will come back in a second because we're going to talk about some of the other countries as well. Competition drove the Spanish to get involved. The Spanish, as you see, they're the eastern neighbor of uh, Spain, is it Portugal, saw this Portuguese wealth and they wanted in on this action as well. Um, now, sadly, again, I, I speak about this, um, I, I want to keep in mind that with this competition really involves conquest. The word I'm using is colonization, but it's really a matter of conquering, taking over and using these resources as their own. But Spain wanted to be sure that they wouldn't lose prestige in this, glo in this increasingly global economy. The two, the two people most involved in this, good to put on the left, are Ferdinand and Isabella, who are the European monarchs. Um, they are the ones who sponsored and supported many of these overseas expeditions and uh, on their own dime and paid for it. Columbus would be one of the people who uh, utilized the money of, the, of um, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. At the time, he thought the world was round. And, and like most educated people in the Renaissance, it's commonly said that he was Christopher Columbus didn't have any support um, for thinking of this, and that really wasn't accurate. Most people did believe the world was round, and he thought he could reach Asia by sailing west, because remember, he had no idea that North America and South America existed. So he thought if he headed west, then he would go directly around the world and immediately encounter uh, Asia. So that's what he set off to do. We'll pause again, because class is about to start. <laughs> 